is included in the conversation? Working with Lambda is going to be critical. Um, obviously, they do amazing work that the UA almost at times doesn't even have to help them because they're, they're so good at making the connections. Um, but where we can help them this next year, and specifically in the president's role, is with the uh, staffing, and by staffing I don't mean actual like professionals, but students who will be on the panels, the, the kind of adjunct panels of this mental health task force. Um, there will be students on there who will be talked to, um, and ensuring that that panel is filled with as diverse a community as possible, including mm -hmm. especially LGBTQ students, um, will be critical. And that's something that certainly including Lambda in the discussion about recommending certain students um, who would be great voices on behalf of the LGBT community on those panels will be really critical and something that the UA can make uh, a connection to very, very simply just by literally just speaking with the office and uh, speaking with uh, several of the members who are on the panel in and of itself. But, yeah. yeah. Um, furthermore, Lambda is an organization, especially as a former 5B chair, that I've done a lot of work with, so I have those existing connections um, and that knowledge to make sure that the, their voices are included in the conversation. Great. Uh, what steps do you think the administ administration can take to address the issue of political discrimination on campus? Both of you have mentioned wanting to work on it, but what concrete steps will you mm -hmm. take to, um, towards solving this problem? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, um, so uh, I worked uh, with POCO uh, in part on this, um, and I've been in, in, in discussions with one of their co-chairs, Vrun Anand, uh, who spoke at University Council about this very issue, and there was a student earlier in the year um, uh, who came to the UA about uh, a certain situation in career services uh, in which she was, she felt, harassed or at least discriminated against in some way because of her conservative political affiliation. Uh, we're going to be honest, Penn is obviously a very liberal campus, um, but at the same time those students who may identify a little bit more conservatively uh, should not feel uncomfortable with expressing their political opinions or affiliations. Um, we come to a school where we feel that we can express ourselves in every way possible. We're here to do that. Um, that's, that's the only way you can create uh, a more uh, mosaic-like community um, in which everyone can feel kind of safe. And so how do we fix it? Um, Essentially, I think working with the Committee on Open Expression, which POCO has talked to before, but really focusing on the results at the end of it. How do we get um, political harassment to be included as one of those elements that, fac that both faculty and students cannot um, indulge upon on a particular student? And that means uh, citing out a particular student in a class if a faculty member is doing that because they may be conservative. Uh, that, may, that may be a student uh, who attacks a student in a class or not physically but certainly verbally um, about a variety of things concerning their own political affiliation. Those things should not be included and people should know that if you do that you will be, you will be punished. Um, that's something that I think I, I, would, I would probably fight for. Yeah, um, he brings up great points once again. Um, I think, so Committee of Open Expression was actually something that fell under my purview as Social Justice Committee Director, so I think that's a great idea. Um, furthermore, I think it comes to sensitivity training. Like I mentioned earlier, um, this is not an issue that is unique to the political community. I think if we can bring bridge connections between uh, the 5B along with POCO, and, and if the UA supported that, I think that would be a powerful stance um, to the administrators to show that this is a crucial issue. Students should not be discriminated against because of aspects of their identity, especially at a place at Penn where President Gutman says to herself, diversity goes hand in hand in excellence, that this shouldn't be happening. So I think that the UA should, I mean, maybe even pre present a resolution to administrators um, with this collective of support. That would be incredible, and I think that would make a powerful statement. So as president, I would advocate for just that. Yeah, um, and even focusing on maybe getting this, uh, even before that, on the UC agenda or having another open forum topic on it, mm -hmm. um, again, would highlight the importance of this to administrators so that they know that it is, that it is an ongoing issue and that they need to address it. Um, I know the UA president holds a very specific role and a very powerful voice on the UC body, mm -hmm. um, along with the other student delegates. That's a voice that I plan to use on behalf of those groups. Yeah. Um, also, I think student expression funding is a huge issue. Um, I think it's this, these, it, it's this ability to express yourself that allows Penn to become a more pluralistic place. Um, I think that there needs to be a loosening, um, of guideline, a loosening of university guidelines for political groups to achieve 
um, to receive funding. I think by having more events, we can create this pluralistic atmosphere that would allow less discrimination to happen. The next question is about engagement with West Philadelphia and was submitted by CHAC. Mm -hmm. What is one issue currently facing the West Philadelphia community that you think the UA should become more involved in solving and how would you recommend going about this? Yeah, um, this is something I feel really passionate about, especially working extensively at the Netter Center for Community Partnerships and Civic House. Um, a lot of the issue is that Penn's history with West Philadelphia hasn't been that great um, because of eminent domain. Penn, under Judith Roden's administration, Penn did push out a lot of its residents, and as a result of that, people in West Philadelphia still harbor this negative experience. It's, the neighborhood that was pushed out was called Black Bottom. Um, I know that the Netter Center is doing incredible work on this. In fact, there are a group of students who want to have a video during NSO, during Penn Life Sketches, which I was actually in uh, my sophomore year, um, to show students so that students understand the important relationship to, the important relationship between Penn and West Philadelphia. Uh, and furthermore, I think there also needs to be sensitivity training on behalf of students who interact with individuals in West Philadelphia. Penn has a robust, robust, robust um, civic engagement, um, whether it's through CSSP, West, Phil West Philadelphia Tutoring Project, but a lot of the feedback I've heard from these different groups is that the training is not, it's, it's not quite instituted. And I'm actually working directly with the Netter Center right now um, to make sure that this training does happen on a regular basis. Yeah, um, certainly working with those groups and promoting their interests uh, is something that the UA should do, like Joyce said. Um, another element of it, I think, is actually using UA members as people who can actually, because they're so outspoken, can actually go out and help, at least for a week. Uh, we have, obviously, uh, our meetings every Sundays at 9 p.m. or so, three hours or so. Um, I think taking one of those weeks and working with CSSP or um, with uh, CHAC uh, to find interesting and, I guess, imaginative ways of serving the West Philadelphia community, whether that's um, through actually communicating with some of the students in the Penn Alexander School, which I know we already do, um, and just having this sense that, like, all right, we don't, we, we, we don't just want to help you in a, in a more personal manner. We want to be ongoing mentors with you. Um, and so even, even highlighting how uh, UA members can get involved specifically to do service on behalf of the community, I think reconstitutes what the UA member is. Not just someone who sits and talks and mm. you know, seems to have an idea, but also gets out there in the community and does work. Um, it helps both the UA's publicity and lets you know what we do, but it also really makes sure that the core, one of the core tenets of the UA, which is service, is actually being fulfilled. Yeah, um, so the UA is charged with three main things, funding, services, and advocacy, and I do think that this does go hand in hand with advocacy. Um, that being said, I do think it is a little problematic if we dedicate certain service sessions with working with CSSP. CSSP is based on a year-long um, mentoring relationship. Um, however, I do think that this um, your awesome service session idea would go perfectly with Penn Weekend Service, which does do these weekend um, short-term service sessions. Yeah, um, so what I meant with CSSP essentially is that they could at least integrate those students, even if only for a time, um, on what they actually do and even take them to uh, one of the schools that they actually work in so that those students, the UA members, can be at least acknowledgeable of both the kind of work that CSSP does, but also what the real issues are in West Philadelphia because again like you said some of the leaders on this campus have no idea what those issues are and they only think about Penn and not West Philadelphia in general. Yeah, great. So um, the next question is going to be about the moratorium mm -hmm. um, submitted by SAC. SAC works closely with the UA to resolve the problems of the moratorium, specifically by speaking to administrators to, walk, uh, to address the higher level issues. Okay. How do you understand the problem of the moratorium as it is now, and how would you go about working with SAC to get new student groups access to funding? Yeah, um, so several things on this SAC moratorium. Um, one, I guess most importantly, uh, is making sure that the communication that's already been established under the current administration um, between the EVP, several facilities on campus that are very popular uh, in use and SAC, um, is maintained. Uh, that the menu uh, of, of facilities and their costs 
um, is properly allocated to all the student groups that are interested in using these facilities so that they know where is probably the best place for them to spend their money to, have to actually host their events. Um, and making sure that, there are, that some of the new spaces on campus, including the arch, which I know is specified for, for some of the cultural centers within the arch, may also be used as, as another space, since I know that PAC is looking for that extra space on campus to house some of their, or not at least house, but to have performances in. Um, this is always going to be an issue. Um, but one other interesting way I've sort of thought about funding is, is actually including an honorarium fund that the UA creates all, all by itself. It would be a small fund, um, but it would be something that student groups can actually apply to the UA for, just to, one, have collaboration events in which they have speakers, um, and some small conferences, which I know some student groups, they only need $1,000 to get really cool speakers on campus, but they can't do it because some of their cultural centers don't have the money to give it to them. Um, I know that SAC doesn't have the money to do it because there are a lot of groups on campus and, and the facilities costs keep rising, um, but certainly the UA can step in as an extra funder if possible. Yeah, um, so from my understanding, the UA already does that through the contingency, through the contingency requests. Um, so that being said, I think it's really important for the time being to push for alternative funding sources. I know Nikolai Zafertov last year created an awesome alternative funding sources guide, but I think the UA could do a much better job of publishing these possibilities for students. Um, that being said, on the long term, uh, I would work with SAC to see what's the best way to fix this problem. I think SAC um, has the best knowledge of what it does. Um, I believe in checks and balances when it comes to student government. So I would work directly with SAC to make this happen. Yeah, certainly work with SAC. Um, but with UA contingency, the problem is that you can't really get access to it unless you prove to the UA that you've gone under literally every single rock on campus to find funding. And that is important and that's critical. Um, but sometimes those groups may not even know what those, what, what those actual places are. And some groups are honestly better connected than others, um, which makes that kind of a difficult process. This would actually, I think, increase uh, that channel of communication one and two funding from the UA to those groups um, that otherwise can't get them. Um, yeah, I think the contingency and the honorarium would be rather redundant. I think it's actually the UA's role to push for this alternate funding sources guide that a UA member created last year, and it would be wide, better widely publicizing that so that students who don't necessarily have those better connections to these funding sources are well informed. I think we are, we are in the perfect position to disseminate information. This would be such the case.